So here we will continue our discussions on the on the granular mechanics simulations. So the second part of the talk is motivated by the fact that for many natural material, the particle shape doesn't resemble a spherical particle. In fact, in many cases, it has a very compact geometry for each individual particle. You can see here as an example. In this particular example, you can see multiple local non-convexity. And on top of that, um, the, not only is the aspect ratio are actually not one to one, but the local non-convex feature may lead to a contact that, uh, that are interlocking each other. If you want to simulate the important mechanics of the particle, what we actually could do is to simulating it with the classical contact mechanics fire element. But this approach would actually have a big burden on simulating the complex boundary. Because if you use a mesh-based method to model the particle, we have to able to stimulate a lot of the details of the particle with a fine mesh that to, just to capture the geometry. But as you can see here, if the contact of the particle are actually in the area that doesn't have very that doesn't necessarily have geometrical complexity, we would we may actually use losing this uh this uh, fine mesh that we uh, computation time uh for to get a displacement field that doesn't necessarily to have much consequence for the mechanics behavior. Okay. And our goal of actually also generating more realistic simulation is also due to the fact that uh, in the recent year, we have the new technology that allow us a more precise verification program that uh, the 3D printing basically enable us to simulate individual particle and also to print individual particle such that the individual particle can you to assemble um, of a DEM uh, of a DEM light particle? But the interesting thing is that in this uh, highly controlled element, we can have a different particle shape, and yet each individual particle will virtually have a similar property. So that would allow us to isolate some of the effect and purely study the shape effect on on the. Uh, on the microscopic outcome when we conduct a different test. Shown here is one simple example where we, we have the 1D compaction test and then on the 3D printing uh, material and we can see in that uh, very interesting uh, 1D uh, compaction curve and the compaction curve can be, can be deducted from the 3D, uh, 3D print material. So why do we want to simulate um, the contact in great details? And why do we want to simulate a deformable particle? The reason is actually the following. If you want to understand the details of the contact, and if the contact is actually important for us to understand the granular mechanics, we actually need to not only able to use the DM to simulate the change of the individual particle, topology change of the, in the inside the entire assemble. But we also want to simulate different nature of contact that not necessarily can be covered in a simple overlapping mechanism. So here is one example. So you see four particles, one, two, three, four, and they're in contact with each other with a wall that are also deformable. If you simulate it with uh, this, Discrete element, we, we may get a shape that somehow looks like this. Okay, and we may actually even get the similar stress chain, except maybe for this point where the non convexity need to feed contact point for a two particle instead of only one. Now, what actually happened is that when you actually have a discrete element you only saw the displacement of the centroid of the particle. There is no way from this four displacement field you can recover the stress. 
And if we cannot recover the stress, there are consequent and limitations of the numerical simulations. The first one is that obviously we cannot model the factor behavior properly because the, if we look at it in small scale, we need the stress concentrations and the energy flux in order to propagate factor according to the classical factor mechanics theory. Without the for with only the displacement and then the force that are caused the contact, there's no way for us to actually predict the factor as we mentioned in the previous lecture. You can give one example if we have a contact that are actually pawn wise, if it is a single pawn, even a force that are very small divided by zero area would need to a singularity. Okay, there are previous methods that actually simulate a particle uh, with a final element that allows some deformity. But actually what we want to concentrate here is to actually analyze if you allow the capture of the stress concentrations to great box revolutions, what would be the consequence if you also allow the damage of the particle? And how does that damage evolving the topology further and lead, um, lead to a more complex a uh, small structure revolution that can be captured numerically and from that how does it affect our microscopic simulations so those are the questions that may bring up from a more detailed simulations and hence we are willing to pay the price of a much higher computational cost in order to achieve this goal so here this is actually the background we want to deal with the challenge without necessarily using a finite element contact problem. The reason is that imagine that we have hundreds or maybe thousands of particles and we actually want to deal with it in finite element ge generating right mesh and then cleaning it up to repair the mesh for individual particle and create a mass lay pair for the contact mechanic. This is simply not a trackable, checkable or doable task. What we want, what we, and then on the other hand, the alternative we have is a DEM that both are based on simplified shakes, pseudo steady state, and then also we have to deal with the loss of the detail on the contact because in a DEM, either you can actually assume rigid body, no penetrations, but then the force, but then the stress, uh, you would actually also lose the stress, or we can actually allow the overlap, which could actually also damage the, the details of the granular contact, particularly if, if you have uh, more than one contact uh, point between the particle. So the key point is the following. How do we actually get the benefit of both to some extent and come up with a new numerical method that are easy to use and yet doesn't necessarily uh, not compete, that being so computational expensive that are not usable? So what we actually did is that we would use a voxel mesh. Now, based on the previous work that uh, that we actually um, um, we actually use uh, and actually extend it to the fictional contact algorithm. Okay. So now, in this approach, we will represent individual particles as a level set, but we will have a fixed background mesh. Okay, so the particle locations are actually represented by the indicator functions F and G, for example, in these two problem, or maybe F1 and F2. And if F1 equals to 1, we know this is the boundary. If this is positive, we know it's outside. If it's negative, we know this is, the, this is actually um, inside the, the individual particle. Now, with the mesh, the, the advantage of this is that we don't necessarily need to match the element because if we have a level set to indicate the locations, we can simply using the indicator functions uh, that are stored in the, in, in the entire grid as a scalar value to tell us where is the particle. So the mesh issues or the meshing issue is resolved. Now the second question is to reconstruct the contact pair that are actually necessary for contact mechanics problem and apply the right constituted law.
the constitutive law that we, we, we actually implement is very simple and very classic. So GN is the normal gap functions and GT is the tangential gap functions. What we actually want to do is that we want to apply the more Coulomb criteria to limit the tangential tractions as a function of the frictional coefficients and the normal tractions. And the normal tractions in contact should be negative, which indicates it's in compact, uh, it is in contact, or it could be actually uh, be, um, be uh, separate from the me mechanics body. And and with this constituted law, we can simulate the problem, but the only problem is that we need to actually identify the gap functions that give us the relative displacement between particle, uh, these two particles, maybe what we'll call it one and two. Okay, so the constraint that we have here is actually um, the two trucker conditions, and then the energy functional we use is actually contain multiple part. It contain the penalty energy to prevent the interpenetrations and the two energy functional that actually replicate the normal and the tangential uh, response of the material. Now, the first thing that uh, the first trick we're trying to do is to recognizing that unlike the extent file element treatment, here we're actually using the indicator function to represent the boundary. As a result, we have the displacement field, but that displacement field would generate a strain in the background mesh for the bug. But what we actually need to do is also using that <clears throat> indicator functions to have a partitions of the behavior where we know that in the contact area, we use the contact mechanics and the gap functions to detect our stress response or the traction response. And then in the bug, we would actually using a classical a file element, uh, but uh, elasticity material to model the bug uh, stress field. So here, without the regularizations, we would have the strong discontinued that is actually very classic. We would actually, we would actually uh, detect the contact and then actually uh, compute the the relative tractions from the from the tangential. Uh, from the tangential elasticity or actually from the, or from the um, fractional uh, coefficient response. Here in the regularized with discontinuity, we will actually introduce the follow, following KT behavior. We try to, we try to say that all the admissible traction field in the tangential and normal directions are actually within the, <coughs> within the Mach Coulomb envelope. And we want to impose the classical positivity, but now apply it into the interface displacement field. That the gap function change is actually related, uh, <clears throat> it's actually proportional to the directions of the gap function change. Okay, so this is just the directions. And we want to actually make sure that um, the, the, the yielding functions and, uh, and the passive multiplier in the tangential directions are actually fulfilling things, the consistent behavior. Now, in order to model prevent the interpenetration inter behavior, we would actually avoid using the extent degree of, ex extra degree of freedom to prevent the interpenetrations. Inter Instead, we were just using a simple penalty method which actually penalize the interpenetrations of the gap of the gap functions if we so what actually happened is that the tractions would be actually generated whenever there is a slight overlap of the material now here this is actually happening uh, not necessarily when the material is overlap but when the integration functions indicate that there are potential contact in the material that we will describe in a moment. So right now, this is actually, this part is actually really a part not necessary just to the volume mesh or the voxel mesh contact mechanics, but also just apply to the general 
uh, mechanics uh, problem that uh, that prevent the interpenetrations. The new part, however, that are actually necessary and important is to how to find these gap functions or the normal and tangential direction when we actually have an indicator have an indicator function to tell us the location of the level set uh, for the particle. So here we will use the level set to define individual particle. This method has been used from a previous work uh, here, but also have been used by the granular element uh, uh, method that are derived by the Caltech group uh, that are lead by Professor Andrade. Uh, the major difference between this work and uh, our work is that our goal is also to recover the stress field that are not necessary, not necessary available in the classical granular element method. So here I'm just give a recap of what is actually a level set. A level set is a scalar functions in the spatial domain, and it indicates that when the product, when the in, when the when the level set is actually equal to zero at that particular point, then we know this is the interface. Okay, and we can actually uh, introduce a sign there. If um, so, the sign can indicate whether it's in phase one or phase two. So in this particular example, the interior is negative. The exterior is positive, but you can also feel free to uh, switch the sign. But the sign change indicate that uh, you are from the one point to another point, indicating that uh, the these two points are in different material or in different material state. So level set is also called uh, indicator functions. So shown here is another applications which we will also talk a little bit about for uh, recovering the middle axis for the void space. So here the level set is used to actually evolve the boundary. So we solve the level set problem by actually imposing uh, the phase, the boundary values of the phase three equal to zero to move. And that would be equivalent to imposing a displacement. This is one example of a rigid body motions. If you want to impose a rigid body motions, what we actually need to do is to evolve the level set of the um, of the uh, the values at the boundary, and go through a process called velocity extensions that uh, allow us to extend the known boundary movement into the entire phase, entire level set, so we can actually uh, allow us to represent the, the movement of the individual um, displacement. Okay, so sometimes this could be uh, mixed by a mark particle method in which we can actually mark individual particle at the boundary and keep track of how does it move and converge the speed functions at the boundary and the, or the velocity uh, in the boundary, and then we can actually solve and then we can solve the revolutions problem of the level set to update the geometry of the individual particle in each time step. This method is actually, the level set is solved in a voxel basis. In fact, in the final volume regimes that are actually provide, that are available on the internet. What we actually do is we couple this final volume code with a homegrown uh, material pond level set code uh, so that we can actually capture the movement and the deformation of the particle by generating the corresponding level set that represent the new boundary or the geometry information of the particle. Now, in order to detect the contact, what we actually introduce is an unbiased contact reference. This is in sharp contract with the master slate contact, where we actually define a master uh, interface and then check the relative displacement of the of the other snake nodes in order to generate the relative displacement. Here, we actually want to create something that are unbiased. There is no distinctions between master slate interface just but we have an unbiased reference point 
that are in between of two particle one and two, and tell us uh, where is the reference. And from the reference point, we can compute the relative displacement by checking the revolutions of that ref of the relative displacement of a point set on the boundary relative to that reference point. So to do that, we need the following. We have two level set functions indicate whether this is a particle one or particle two, for example, I call it I and J. Okay, so at this point, the level set for I would be actually equal to zero. This is scalar functions. And then for the level set J, so this is equal to zero at the boundary. And what we're actually trying to do is to compute the minimum between the two. So what it means is that uh, if you have a few, the minimum is actually compare point by point. So if you have a level set that uh, looks like this for the, for the first level set, and then for the next one, you have this, then you take the minimum between the two, which means that this, this would be the minimum, okay? Now, this minimum minimum point can be reinitialized re to actually generate this particular intrinsic shape. Okay, so this is actually useful because for two particle, we can actually using the shift functions to find out where is the rough location of the contact, and then we can actually find out which point set in the material in the uh, in the mesh that's fulfilling this potential contact area. And from that contact area, what we want to do is that using these two interface to introduce a reference, reference, uh, a reference uh, surface. Okay, so this is the active level set. And, then, and that are actually coming from the two. And what we actually can do from that uh, uh, but from actually finding the level set and then the contact area is to locate this reference point. This reference point for each individual particle would actually tell us where is the relative uh, uh, displacement. As we're changing the displacement field, uh, we actually what we actually need to do is actually for each incremental step, what we actually need to do is actually to project this uh, contact point into the upper and lower surface, I and J. And then from the relative displacement of I and J, we can find out the gap vector. The gap vector will actually give us the normal gap and the tangential gap by actually checking the from that reference point, what is the relative positions of this, these two particles moving. So we can match for each individual point, we can map it into at the reference point, we can map it into the corresponding upper and lower interface. And if we can have a point by point pair, we can generate the, the, the relative displacement jump uh, between the two particles. And from the displacement jump, we can recover the checksums from the corresponding more column uh, envelope constituted law. So the problem, once we define that gap function, the rest of the problem is really trivial. For example, a very common contact problem with the energy functional for the normal and tangential contact and also the penalty. This energy would be added into the classical uh, boundary value problem that give us the first variations. And from that, we can get the width form just like the displacement phase, phase final element with just the additional term for us to calibrate or uh, to, to actually keep track of the contact. Now, the next ingredient that could be really helpful is the introductions, introduction of the material point. For us to capture the revolutions of the contact, okay, or in particular to help us carry out the important task of recovering the stress field that require a lot of refinement. So the, I think there are previous the uh, speaker that talked about the material point. So here we are mainly a user of the material point for this particular problem. So uh, in this particular, in all the problem, you can actually consider the fact that um, we have a contagium and then we're partitioning it using a grid-like system. And we actually 
assign the material point to represent the mass or the or carry out uh, a path dependent material in that uh, material point data. So we create a point set to carry out the information and from the material point, we will actually subject that uh, material point to the background mesh. The background mesh can be solved in the finite elements and that with the classical, maybe uh, linear low order basis functions, but the integration point can be uh, can be just the material point or some kind of projections of the material point. And we actually can, if the boundary is conformal to the bound to the mesh, we can simply apply the boundary at the grid. Or if it's not, we can try to project it back into the to the closest grid and then apply the uh, uh, and then interpolate or extrapolate the boundary conditions. In each time step, the external force would actually causing the 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 background mesh to move. But instead of moving the background mesh, we would apply the corresponding displacement field in that material point. So the material point would move according to the displacement, like from from what happened in the old material point to the new material point, and and this this movement would actually allow us to carry the information into the evolved geometry. We then using a new mesh, and at the new mesh, we actually update the. The level set to give us the new boundary, and so that we can evolve the deformations with uh, without actually modify anything uh, on the mesh. So now, coupling the level set and material point will allow us to <clears throat> to capture the resolution of the boundary. But here is the one problem. In general, you don't know how many material point you would have for a given grid. So sometimes you can have 10 here, and sometimes you have one here, sometimes you have two here. And that can actually lead to some issues, like uh, it will reduce the accuracy of the volumetric integration if you don't have enough integration point. Or when you have too many, for, you, would, you may actually experience locking, particularly if the material is really incompatible. So what we actually do is the following. We use a track that are very common in material point community. Uh, in each time step, we use the, in the initial time step, we will use the classical gases point locations, or maybe if you have a triangle element, we just put the material point at the middle to better capture the boundary. But at each point, when the material point is actually moving, uh, we were actually trying to using the new material point a value and to and using a moving least square projections to compute the corresponding values of uh, any material property or internal variable back into the old gases bond. The the advantage of using the gases bond is that you can control the accuracy of the integration mechanism. So so integrations uh numerical integrations uh and for example for four point or with, uh, for core element, you can actually control the order of accuracy easily by projecting the material point information back into the standard gases point locations. The drawback is that uh, the moving these square projections from the new gases point data back into the gases point may, may actually introduce some error that kill off the accuracy. So you get some, uh, you, you, you actually also do some from that projections. But then the important part is that we don't want to deal with uh, simulations where if the material point is actually have certain populations, you get a different quality or heterogeneous quality of volumetric integrations. So this is actually one of the tricks that can actually help the problem at the expense of, the, of some accuracy. So before we actually try to simulate the actual granular mechanic, we actually simulate some modification problem and compare it with the literature. So this is actually the first problem with a modification of two blocks that are actually prescribed a velocity uh, or actually in that case displacement and then there's attractions on the side. 
And when the when the material hit, we want to see whether we can actually recover the results that are available in the literature. And so here is actually the results, and we actually found that the new method seems to work in that uh, in that contact problem. And then you can see that the deformed check is actually very reasonable. And the fact that uh, these two points is not contact is because of these attractions. Okay, so we want to see okay if we actually whether whether this pattern is actually uh, corresponding or actually identical to each other. In the second example, we have an existing uh, uh, contact that doesn't necessarily evolve that much. And we want to check the slipping and then the stake. We want to actually see what happens when we apply the vertical stress but, or displacement, but not necessarily lead to the, we want to detect whether it's actually stick at the right moment and then start to slide once you hit the friction angle coefficients uh, attractions. So you can see here, so in the first case, you have a continuous displacement field that indicating that the material is actually in a stick uh, contact behavior. So the normal stress is actually enough to prevent it from slipping. But then the, later on, uh, the horizontal displacement is showed the uh, relative the motions. This is actually another classical verification problem. Another verification problem we also choose is actually also the a problem that are also very classical. We apply the relative displacement and on the top, and then we actually fix the bottom, and then we see whether we recover the stress field that have an article solution available. The article solution is actually in the solid. Um, a line in a red, a red line, dash red line, and then a solid blue line, and then the pawn are actually the material bond calculations. As you can see, these simulations actually match pretty well for the contact NPM level set problem. And then we also check whether it preserves the symmetry. In this problem, <coughs> we have the analytical solution of a spherical particle that have four perfect contact, and in a periodic domain, and what we want to check is actually whether we can recover the stress field, um, uh, the shear field in the xy uh, direction, whether we can re re recover the uh, the analytical periodic pattern. And here we can see in that the result is actually uh, looks very promising. Uh, but one actually very important thing we want to also check is also the the issue of mesh sensitivity. If you look at the history of the modeling deformable particle, there are early work that advocate using the, the discrete element uh, and a couple with finite element. And the finite element would actually have a mesh by what we've shown here, uh, perhaps a very coarse mesh. And then they have some contact that are determined by the, by the discrete element. What they actually find out is that the result between the, the finite element DEM, not so the, the, the DEM that have a finite element inside for each individual particle is not so much different than the, than the classical DEM. The reason is actually uh, the following, uh, as we investigate the problem. Okay, if you don't have a fine mesh, you're not likely to capture the stress concentrations like what we've shown here. The reason is the following when we have a small contact. Okay, and this point, let's say that we have a point wise contact, then no matter how small the force it is, force divided by area that approaching zero will give us infinite stress. It will become a singular point. However, if you actually have a mesh, like what I show here, your integrations of the vertical stress is actually based on the gas's point stress. And as the gas's point is actually quite far away or have some distance from the singular point, the stress here is actually finite. However, what actually happened is that the, uh, you would, so enhance the external force you actually compute from the mesh would also be finite. The issue, however, is that the contact would lead to, would have a very severe uh, mesh dependency because as you refine the contact, you, you would have gases point that are much closer to the singular point and the stress would just skyrocket. 
So to actually capture this problem without the mesh dependency, even in the small scale, we may need a size-dependent behavior damage model to help us uh, overcome the mesh dependency. Or at the very least, we need to have an intraday rate dependency to regulate the damage to the, the singular point uh, plastic deformations. But here we just want to show, okay, so a small change on the mesh can actually increase the, the stress and that won't stop. Okay, because the finer the mesh you are, the closer to the singular point. And that is actually one of the problems that in the previous work, in the FEM DEM, uh, we never actually see any major difference between the DEM and then the FEM DEM, simply because there is not enough mesh to capture the the, con the the contact point in very small area. In general, you may not have a point wise contact, but the small area contact will also lead to a huge sensitivity on the mesh that are near the boundary. Okay, as you can see. Uh, in here, you probably it probably doesn't matter how coarse the mesh is unless it's super coarse. But you can see that the mesh quality or the number of gases spawn or the stress spawn, uh, there, there is a resolution issue that need to tackle before we can actually resolve the stress field properly. Okay, so this is actually one problem. Again, but however, the problem is that here we actually introduce the trick that we use is that for all the outer boundary, we simply using a smaller mesh so that we can actually, um, in case there's a stress concentration, at least at the boundary, we can capture the details. Okay, but there are other better technology that we may consider, like the edge refinement or with the material porn or actually adding more material porn to add the stress calculations more accurate, et cetera, et cetera. Now, but here we still want to emphasizing that uh, the method is able to capture the different nature of the contact. And also for the single, uh, for two particle, you can actually capture the multiple contact point that uh, may not be otherwise necessary available in the DEM simulations. So this is one of the simulation example. You can see the difference between a hydrostatic test a pure shear test and simple shear test and how does the granular nature affect the microscopic behavior. In the ISO in the ISO compaction test, basically you, you actually make the uh, sample a little bit smaller or a little bit bigger. But provided contact is actually uh, in there, it doesn't change that much. You can see in that the contact that the profile are uh, actually simply increasing the magnitude, but unless you actually have a very large, uh, uh, unless you actually continue to compact in it, uh, you can probably see similar uh, response without that much change. Now here, if you look at the second problem, okay, you see a little bit of difference. And actually, um, as you can see in these regions, or in these regions. So this, these uh, details, this detail can actually be only captured if we can recover the stress field and actually allow using a level set to So I want to mention the follow, following future work. In the future, what we want to analyze is not only understand the relationship between the force train that are obtained from the DEM to the final element, but also how does that uh, more detailed simulations may enable us to discover other topological information that are not available in the literature right now. For example, if I have the invariance of the stress, I can actually assemble different types of uh, chain that are invariant chain for the first, second, third invariance, and then they may have different topology that can be supplement the force chain or actually provide us more indicator of how to compute the stress in the homogenized granular assemble as a whole and also help us to have a new descriptor or machinery to understand the granular nature of the material. So this is the end of the part two of the talk. I want to thank the sponsor, uh, uh, particularly in the US, the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, uh, Columbia University, in particular the Army and Air Force that provide me the funding and also the NSF uh, 
um, including the NSF Career Award that actually propelled the whole research. I also want to thank particular my former postdoc again, Chan Chi Liu, for completing this research. This is actually the work that more or less done by him uh, during a very short tenure at Columbia. So, um, and uh, I also want to once again thank the organizer for inviting me. And I want to thank the audience for having the patience to listen to my lecture in a virtual environment for such a long time. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. My email is actually wsun at Columbia edu. You can also look at the website here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope we'll see each other soon. Bye.